Um, thank you for coming this afternoon. Hopefully you might find some of this interesting. One can never be quite sure with the weather. Um, but hey, it's a national obsession. So, um, so just a bit about myself. Um, so as Matt mentioned, I'm the archivist of the National Meteorological Archive. Um, so that's down in Exeter. And that's our nice posh Met Office building where we're not based. Um, <laughs> and that's the archive, which is a far more familiar sort of setup. Um, we're just across the road, um, and that's the library there. That is based in the nice posh building. Um, and all of our records, apart from just a few that have got personal records in them, um, are all open to public, um, although the archive side of things you do need to book in advance because it takes us a little time to find some of it, even though most of it's very well catalogued, I promise. Um, so uh, we care for what we tend to call the national memory of the weather, um, so that's basically all of the Met Office records produced since 1854 when Met Office was founded, um, and then a selection of international records, rare books, um, and the collection that belongs to the Royal Meteorological Society. Um, now I say that we look after everything, but actually that's not quite true. Um, okay, this is not going to play ball. Um, fine, okay, I'll just make up that bit. Um, <laughs> It's showing me a little bit of my slide, not all of it. Um, so that's not that's not quite true. We don't hold everything that belongs to the, um, that's been produced because all the Scottish records are held up in Scotland um, in between two sites. That's Softon House, where the Met Office is currently based, and National Records of Scotland. Um, and then all the Irish, all the Northern Irish records are held here by Prony. Um, we look after the English and Welsh records down in Exeter, along with all the international stuff, all the publications and everything else. Um, and so my job up in Scotland, I actually catalogue all those records and I'm moving them all so shortly they'll all be just at National Records of Scotland. Um, and then um, over here it's more just kind of being a, a contact point who actually knows where all of the archives are and technically what to do with them. So more about kind of assisting with access than anything else really. So, I could have started anywhere for this talk, really. I mean, we've got so much stuff. Um, so I thought, with a vast scope of options, I'd I basically just let the, let the records do the talking. Um, and sort of we'll do a whistle-stop tour of some of the most significant developments in meteorology using some of the treasures that we hold in down in Exeter. It's not <coughs> meant to be a comprehensive history of meteorology. Um, we'd be here for about three weeks. Um, so it just focuses on some of the developments where we've got relevant materials in the archive. And no discussion on the history of meteorology would be complete without really starting with Aristotle. Um, so, whilst many of his ideas in relation to meteorology were somewhat wide of the mark, um, he can be credited with coining the term meteorology, uh, which literally means the treatment of things high up. Um, and indeed, his book of the same name, um, he wrote Meteorology, um, he was the first person to theorise the existence of a landmass in the southern high latitude region and call it Antarctica. And he was also the first person to accurately define the hydrological cycle, which is better known to us as the water cycle, which is a fairly impressive achievement in the 4th century BC. Uh, we've got a couple of co copies of Aristotle's work in the collection. This is our earliest, and it dates to 1610. So it's also a fairly interesting example of an early printed book just in itself. Um, from Aristotle, we fast forward a bit to the late 13th century and an illuminated manuscript of the text which is called De Negotio Naturali, so it's Latin, um, and that translates as On Natural Business. Um, it's by the Austrian bishop and philosopher Albertus Magnus. Um, Magnus died in 1280, and our volume of this work is an early copy dating back to about 1290. So this would have been produced in a monastery, sort of written by, by a monk and a carol. Even without knowing the content, it's interesting as an illuminated manuscript but actually the content is of some interest too. Um, at this point, I should admit that the documents in medieval Latin were a whole load of contractions, and my classical Latin is not up to that. Um, but I do know that it's about a number of subjects now commonly known as the natural sciences. Um, and in an era when it was, let's be fair, unwise to question the supremacy of God or the teachings of the Catholic Church as a whole, Magnus seems to have taken a very analytical approach and actually questioned quite a lot of the standard practice of the time. And he questioned the work of Aristotle and other great thinkers. From a meteorological point of view, one of the key things in his book is a study of optics, in this case reflection and refraction. 
By experimenting with light, Magnus realized that the only way a rainbow could be formed was if raindrops were spherical. And considering the nature of white light itself was not understood until the work of Isaac Newton almost 400 years later, I think that's a fairly impressive achievement. Saint Albertus Magnus, as he later became, is now the patron saint of natural scientists, which, given the ideas explored in here, I think is quite appropriate. Um, it's also just got you know, really nice illuminated letters and things like that. Yes, sorcery. As with so much in, in, in science, the development of meteorological thinking was not exactly straight line. Um, and the work of Albertus Magnus marks the zenith of the subject for some considerable time. Indeed, foretelling the weather was actually outlawed as a form of sorcery by Henry VIII, as it was seen as a sort of prophecy and implied a magical ability to tell the future. Foretelling the weather was one thing, but those who could foretell the future might also look into the fate of the monarch, which was rather less desirable. Uh, further witchcraft acts of 1604 and 1735 reinforced the position, and, and although some elements were removed, the act was actually not fully repealed until 1951, when it was replaced with the Fraudulent Mediums Act. Now, I've not researched the subject in detail, but given the Met Office was founded in 1854, 97 years before the repeal of the Act, it does seem just possible to me that for some of its 165-year history, the legality of the weather forecast may have been slightly doubtful. A lack of scientific pro progress, at least until the dawn of the Enlightenment, does not, however, mean that the archive is essentially a meteorological dark ages. We've actually got some very interesting things for the period. And whilst actively foretelling the weather might have been illegal, this did not prevent the development of a great deal of weather law, an expansive subject covering meteorology, seasonal change, and just about you name it else. So the earliest book of weather law in the archives, this lovely thing here, is a very rare and possibly unique copy of the Shepherd of Banbury's rules to judge the change of the weather. This one dates from 1670. The rules were apparently produced as a result of 40 years study and provide a series of indications of good and poor weather, wind, rain, thunderstorms, snow. And yes, it does include a version of that most famous of observations, red sky at night. Here it is, red set of red, it signifies fair weather, etc. And out of interest, Red Sky at Night does actually have a sound basis in meteorology. It also describes what we would now consider uh, cumulonimbus clouds and some of the associated atmospheric conditions. So somewhere over there, into my sight, we should find a reference to towers and great heaps. There we go. Uh, we don't know much about the Shepherd of Banbury, uh, but these walls were considered sufficiently accurate that several pages of the Met Office Meteorological Glossary were devoted to them even as late as the early 20th century. Now, it would be wrong to imply that all such material is useful or accurate. Many volumes list in great detail all the changes one would find in nature that indicate the approach of rain. Indeed, you'd, find, you'd be forgiven for thinking that just about anything is a sign of rain. Of the 32 signs in Inwood's weather law, that's the one at the top, only two are not about rain, snow, or bad weather, and only five of the 47 bird signs. They provide a source of amusement in today's rather rational thinking world, but also represent a window into the society of their times. Some weather law relates to the presence or absence of animals at given times of the year, and it was thought, as you'll see from the bottom one there, that swallows hibernated in winter or even underwent some sort of metamorphosis and withdrew underwater in a slightly altered state. And in this woodcut from Aldous Magnus, you can see them actually fishing for swallows. Uh, I mean, yeah, it, was, it reveals an understanding of the concepts of metamorphosis and hibernate, hibernation. You can see that in the bottom of your garden. But what it shows is the concept of migration was just not understood by societies who rarely travelled any great distances at this period. So weather law may have been a less than perfect science, but it was based on the concept of close observation of meteorological and climatological phenomena. And as we've already seen, there was accuracy amongst the myth. With the Age of Enlightenment came increased interest in the desire for more accurate observation and the dawn of instrumental meteorology. The National Meteorological Archive Rare Book Collection contains many of the seminal works that would go on to provide the building blo blocks of meteorological science by authors such as Bacon, Boyle, Hooke, you'll see a few examples up there, and some lovely documents showing early designs for early and uh, artistic barometers and thermometers, shall we say. I'm not sure how accurate they would have been, but they were certainly very pretty. By the early 1800s, meteorological instruments were firmly established scientific tools and were available to the wealthier classes in society and across government institutions. Among the sciences, there was an increased desire for standardisation 
and meteorology was no exception. Between 1803 and 1806, two men, neither of them meteorologists by trade, would produce works that have left an indelible imprint on the world of meteorology to this day. Their names were Luke Howard and Francis Beaufort. Luke Howard was a professional pharmacist and an amateur meteorologist, who's been dubbed the father of meteorology. He produced a series of comprehensive observations of the weather in the London area, and is, and is credited with having first discovered the concept of the urban heat island, where temperatures at night in the cities don't fall as low as those in the countryside. He attributed that to the number of coal fires burning in close proximity in the densely packed areas of housing. Not quite right, but not a million miles off the mark. We've actually got all of his um, diaries in, in the archive down in Exeter. Um, although his detailed observations were undoubtedly influential, Howard's probably better known as the namer of clouds. In 1803, he published his groundbreaking essay on the modification of clouds, which set out to classify the three main types of cloud and some of their intermediate and compound forms. Howard wasn't the first person to attempt to do this. There'd been at least two other attempts previously. But he was successful where others had failed because of his choice of terminology. As a Quaker, he was keen the names he chose should have no religious reference, and so he devised his nomenclature from Latin or Latinized words, creating three key types and three compound forms. We've got a first edition of his essay, and that's what these images are taken from. So his three main types were cirrus, lock or tuft of hair, cumulus, heap, and stratus, which is really hard to see at the bottom, but flattened or spread out. And then the compound forms were cirrocumulus, cirrostratus, and cumulocirrostratus vel nimbus, which we now know as cumulonimbus clouds. Howard's cloud types are still in use to this day, although the range of modifications has been significantly increased and a few new terms have been added. But just as with his original classification system, all the new terms are derived from Latin or Latinized vocabulary. So we now have things like pyrocumulus. Howard's work had a significant influence on some of his great artistic contemporaries. Turner and Constable are both thought to have observed and painted their clouds with greater accuracy after reading his work, and his influence is especially clear in the works of Constable, where the clouds are particularly realistic, as you can see from the Hayway and the Salisbury Cathedral above. And meanwhile, Goethe was so impressed that he wrote the poem in honour of Howard, and I've just put a little extract of it up here. of the line, defined the doubtful. Arguably even more influential in the history of meteorology, we come to 1806 and Admiral Sir Francis Beaufort, or Commander Beaufort, as he was more properly at the time. Beaufort was born in 1774, the younger son of a Protestant clergyman from County Meath, Ireland. Um, and he was... He went to sea at the age of 14 with the British East India Company and then joined the Royal Navy. Beaufort came to specialise in the creation of charts and as a skilled surveyor, he understood the importance of accurate measurements. As his career developed, he became increasingly dissatisfied with the established means of measuring and recording wind speed in naval logs. He kept weather diaries, which we've got in the archive, and throughout his career, and they include almost, amongst other things, mentioned the Battle of Trafalgar and a secret code we've still to crack. But arguably the single most important diary entry dates the 16th of January 1806, when he wrote the following words at the top. Hereafter I shall estimate the force of the wind according to the following scale, as nothing can convey a more uncertain idea of wind and weather than the old expressions of moderate and cloudy, etc., etc. And he then proceeded to inscribe the first ever version of the Beaufort scale, followed by a series of Beaufort letters to describe weather conditions. As you can see, the first, had, the first scale had 13 types, finishing with storm, so not quite what we'd expect today. Um, and it probably wasn't the easiest to use since it had six types of gale, just for a start. But he rapidly honed and improved it. And in the first page of his 1807 diary, we see we've got 12 forces ending in hurricane, which is basically what we still have today. Um, we can see a, a much more recognisable wind scale there. And actually, next to it um, are the ways in which you would measure that against a man of war, which was a Royal Naval frigate. Um, so today we'd call kind of that an impact scale. Both of letters are less well known today, but were in use in meteorological observing until very recently, and one or two do still survive in aviation codes. Thanks to the preeminence of the Royal Navy and the imperial might of the British Empire, both its wind scale was adopted around the world. Very quickly, actually. 
And although we leave behind the diary at this point, we actually won't be leaving Francis Beaufort at this stage in the story. Indeed, his hand is actually right in the heart of what may be termed the birth of the science of meteorology in the UK. Beaufort and his contemporaries and predecessors had provided the tools, but for the start of meteorological science in Britain, we must look to 1854 and the foundation of the Met Office, or as it was rather less snappily known at the time, the Office of Meteorolog Meteorological Statistics of the Board of Trade. The establishment of a meteorological office at this moment in time was a response to the International Meteorological Conference of 1853. At this meeting, representatives from governments around the world agreed to share observation data from ships moving around the oceans in order to enable the creation of maritime charts, showing prevailing winds and currents around the globe. Even political enemies were actually willing to share meteorological data to benefit from access to the resulting charts, and indeed this marks one of the earliest global data sharing initiatives, perhaps even the earliest of all, in fact. Britain was no exception and established a meteorological office under the command of Robert Fitzroy, whose title was Meteorological Statist to the Board of Trade. Why Fitzroy? Who he? Here both that comes back into our story. Fitzroy was a brilliant Royal Naval Surveyor and had come to the attention of Beaufort, who treated him as a protégé. Beaufort played a significant part in securing for Fitzroy the captaincy of the Beagle on her famous circumnavigation of the globe, and even suggested the young naturalist Charles Darwin was a suitable gentleman companion for the voyage. Beaufort later supported Fitzroy's election to the Royal Society, and when the government approached them to recommend a good candidate for the role of meteorological statist, it was Beaufort who suggested Fitzroy for the job. Fitzroy was a genius and a workaholic who cared perhaps too much about his work. He certainly took criticism very badly and very personally, which is never a good idea when you work with the weather. I tried to decide my top treasure associated with Fitzroy, but I failed, so I'm going to show you a few. Well, hopefully it will help to show the importance of his, his importance in the history of meteorology. And for the first, we have a synoptic chart for 9am on the 26th of October 1859, which makes it the oldest chart in our collection, and possibly the oldest in the world. Oldest synoptic chart, that is. Synoptic simply means a synopsis of the weather at a given point in time plotted onto a chart, and it's actually one of the many terms that Fitzroy coined. The chart depicts the Royal Charter Gale, which was considered to be the most severe storm to hit the Irish Sea in the 19th century. The storm depression was first noted in the Bay of Biscay near Cape Finisterre on the 24th, 25th of October, and the centre progressed northwards over Britain from Cornwall to the Yorkshire coast. The strongest winds in the system developed as a rather narrow northerly stream over the Irish Sea, reaching Hurricane Force 12 on the Beaufort scale, with gusts estimated well over 100 miles an hour. Um, it's not easy to tell, but on this, on this one, basically the length of the line shows you the strength of the wind gusts. So you can see here, um, you know, there's some extremely long lines, especially around the Anglesey area, which will come into play in a moment. The most famous ship to founder during the night was the Steam Clipper Royal Charter. The ship was on the last leg of her two-month journey from Melbourne to Liverpool. She was one of the fastest and most famous emigrant ships operating during the years of the Australian Gold Rush and could carry up to 600 passengers and cargo, and quite a bit of gold. As conditions in the Irish Sea deteriorated on board the Royal Charter, her captain had to decide whether to seek shelter at Holyhead or carry on for Liverpool. He chose to continue. Bad idea. By 10pm on the 25th, the wind had reached force 10 and continued to rise, and sea conditions, sea conditions prevented the Liverpool pilot from reaching the ship. At 11pm they made the decision to anchor, but at 1.30 the port anchor chain snapped, followed an hour later by the starboard anchor chain. Uh, despite cutting the mast to reduce the drag from the wind, the uh, engines couldn't keep up with the, uh, with the drag on the ship, and she struck the rocks at Point Alerth, which is just in the north of Anglesey. Battered by huge waves, the ship very quickly broke up. The precise number of dead is not certain, as the complete passenger list went down with the ship but it's thought to be about 459 souls, including all of the women and children aboard. It was impossible to reach the ship, even though it was in sight from the coast. There were only 40 survivors, that was the few men who could actually manage to swim ashore via a rope, and it remains the highest death toll of any shipwreck on the Welsh coast. The wreck gained much coverage in the national press, it was even written about by uh, Charles Dickens, and focused attention on the desire for storm warnings to reduce further such losses. Based on his experiences in collating meteorological data over the past five years, Fitzroy believed his department could provide exactly such a service. He produced a series of charts, of which that one on the previous slide is the only original that we know to have survived, and used them to write a detailed report to provide that the storm to prove, sorry, that the storm could have been predicted. 
Through his analysis of the Royal Charter and other storms, Fitzroy demonstrated the, the validity of his models and proposed a national storm warning system. There was much doubt amongst the scientific establishment the weather could be predicted in any meaningful way. It was an act of God, essentially. But the government permitted Fitzroy to test his new science of weather forecasting and to establish a storm warning service. They basically figured they had nothing to lose. There was so much pressure to do something. The service used the new electric telegraph to collect observations taken around the British coasts. Uh, nothing would have been possible had the telegraph not been, uh, it, it not been invented. We needed the speed of that to actually get anything to happen. These were assessed then at the Meteorological Office Headquarters in London, and if necessary, storm warnings were issued out to the relative areas. The warnings then had to be conveyed to the ships before the days of radio. So Fitzroy developed a really brilliantly simple method of cones and drums, this is what you can see up here. Made from canvas, the shapes would appear the same no matter which angle they were viewed from, and the combination in which they were hoisted told you which direction to expect a storm. His system is credited with saving hundreds of lives, and he became a hero to many in the maritime community, including the RNLI. The first warning was issued on the 5th of February, 1861, and the Storm Warning Service is now believed to be the oldest national forecasting service in the world. It still continues to this day. It's now known as the Shipping Forecast. Uh, and in the great tradition of, if it ain't broke, Fitzroy's visual symbols actually carried on being used until, I think it's 1984. Yes, 1984, by which time they thought every vessel would have a radio. Not content with saving lives at sea, Fitzroy felt that an awareness of the weather to be expected would also be of interest just to the public as a whole. And he therefore placed the first ever public weather forecast in the Times on the 1st of August 1861. You can see the draft of it on the left here, written in the Daily Weather Report. Uh, you'll notice he forgot the east on the first day. Um, and then the actual original version is hidden here underneath the observations for the previous day. Sadly, as brilliant a man as he was, he may have overstretched himself with these forecasts. The first one was actually accurate, but in more unsettled periods, there was just not enough understanding and data to make an accurate forecast, and his work was heavily ridiculed and criticised by the scientific establishment. Fitzroy, as I've mentioned, took everything personally and became very depressed. It's believed that this constant criticism, in addition to facing bankruptcy, as he spent almost all his fortune on developing and distributing a barometer specifically to aid fishermen who operated from small harbours that could not benefit from the storm warning service, the cones and drums, may have led to his tragic suicide in April 1865. Given that he never received the recognition he deserved for his groundbreaking achievements, it is rather ironic that his last forecast was actually produced on the orders of Queen Victoria, who required a weather forecast before sailing to her little house on the Isle Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. To leave Fitzroy here would be, I think, to do the man a disservice. His legacy very much lives on. So my last item relating to him is his weather book, a small tome of over 500 pages, which he wrote during a summer holiday. This page shows how Fitzroy constructed wind stars and displayed prevailing global weather data in a usable format. Essentially, it's the Mark I windrows. Of course, science has moved on, and not all the content in the book is accurate, but the weather book could be considered his first true textbook of the science of meteorology. And I just wanted to pick up a couple of points that show you some, how some parts of his work remain absolutely current. First is the term forecast itself, now universally understood and recognised, but actually invented by Fitzroy to differentiate his work based on the scientific methodology from previous styles of prediction. In his book, Fitzroy states, prophecies or predictions they are not, the term forecast is strictly applicable to such an opinion as is the result of scientific combination and calculation. And secondly, we have the following phrase, which always, always impresses today's operational meteorologists when I have them come round the archive. Fitzroy states that a forecaster should only employ words indicative of probable extent of variability. Using probabilities rather than certainties to describe conditions is something you'll still be very familiar with from weather forecasts. So we've reached the birth of modern scientific meteorology and the start of the long road that leads to meteorological and climate science that we know today. The archive holds literally thousands of tons of observational documentation from 1854 to around 2005. After that, most records are held in electronic format. But whilst really important, it's not exactly all that interesting to look at. So I thought I'd illustrate the 20th century with a few treasures that show some of the slightly different aspects to meteorological work during that period. 
So, the fate of, Robert, of, of Captain Robert Falcon Scott and his team on the ill-fated race to the South Pole in 1913 is well known. But many do not realise the scientific investigation and discovery lay at the heart of the Terra Nova expedition. The meteorological registers produced by the expedition are held at the National Meteorological Archive. The team actually spent many months, including at two Antarctic winters, studying the unknown continent. An important part of their investigations was to make a detailed record of the weather and climate. And to achieve this, Scott in, in, told all of his team they'd have to take weather observations and appointed meteorologist George Simpson, apparently nicknamed Sunny Jim because of his uncanny resemblance to the mascot for Force Cereal. I've seen a couple of, I've selected here a couple of pages from the registers which illustrate the conditions and the humour with which the team faced adversity. The Northern Party demonstrated considerable ingenuity when making meteorological observations. They designed themselves an alarm clock to help them make nighttime observations without having to stay awake. It was called a Caruso phone. We think it might have been because the disc was by Caruso. So essentially you've got a gramophone in the middle, um, a bamboo cane under tension with a string on the right hand side. Um, it's going to work, yes. And then a candle on the left. So you, mark, you, you place the string where you want at the appointed time on the candle, start the candle burning. When it goes through the string, it releases the bamboo cane, releases the needle onto the gramophone, and off you go. It didn't always work. There's various references to Carusophone failed again in the records. It was clearly not universally loved. Um, and observer Raymond Priestley penned a rather entertaining poem to the meteorological alarm, which we found at the back of one of the registers. The final line reads, The devil waits for souls like yours in hell. And he was referring to the alarm clock. Now, the lowest recorded temperature encountered during the Terra Nova expedition was experienced by Bill Wilson, Henry Bowers, and Anthony Cherry Garrard, whilst trekking to Cape Crozier to recover three emperor penguin eggs. It was believed that the embryos inside would reveal the evolutionary link between reptiles and birds. Cherry Garrard, who later described the journey in his book, The Worst Journey in the World, never recovered from the expedition, Bowers and Wilson would perish with Scott. The eggs are actually considered to be among the top ten most important items owned by the Natural History Museum, and they rank alongside Archaeopteryx and a piece of moon rock from the Apollo landings. And that's not so much for the scientific significance. By the time they were investigated, they were long past being of any actual use in terms of evolutionary history. It's because of the incredible feat that these men went to to actually get those eggs. The lowest temperature recorded on their journey was minus 77.5 Fahrenheit, which is minus 68 degrees centigrade. They were travelling in darkness 24 hours, and it took two men to, to haul each sled, so that's five miles of travel for each one mile actually travelled forward. These observation notebooks are of great importance to the historical record just for their association with the Terra Nova, but they did also further the understanding and science of, Art of Antarctic meteorology. After his return from the expedition, George Simpson used the data they'd collected to write an important account of weather and climate on the continent. He concluded that Scott and his team had actually met with exceptionally low temperatures on their return from the pole, and also demonstrated that the transition from Antarctic summer to winter was far more rapid than previously supposed. They were expecting autumn and, winter, autumn and spring seasons and found that they just didn't really exist. This, is, this knowledge greatly assisted later expeditions, who'd been much better prepared for such extreme environments and highlighted the need to understand more about them, um, which indeed is still very much the case. And there are meteorologists, Met Office staff still regularly detached to the British Antarctic Survey stations um, at Halley 6 and at Rothera. Changing course slightly, the Met Office was not involved in military forecasting at the start of the First World War. They offered their services, um, but the, the answer came back, the army does not go to war with umbrellas. Attitudes soon changed. A meteorological field service, universally known as Meteor RE, Royal Engineers, was established in the summer of 1915. The Met Office back in London also became operational 24-7 for the first time at that point to support their colleagues out in France. Meteor provided three key services, gas forecasting to warn of conditions favourable for gas attacks, that required observers to work literally on the front lines, upper air observations to aid the artillery with high angle fire and the development of their artillery spotting balloons, that required observers to go up in, air, in, in balloons and actually take uh, readings at X thousand or X hundred feet, should I say and forecast for the fledging Royal Flying Corps. By October 1916, it had become clear that more detailed forecasts were required to assist with military operations as a whole, 
and Sir Ernest Gold, who was the chief forecaster out in France, in France produced the earliest known operational defence forecast for British military forces on the 24th of October 1916, which is this one here. Um, and then a little later on, uh, we actually have a thank you telegram for accurate forecasting, which we rather like. Met Office personnel played key roles on all fronts in World War II, and you would rather expect me to mention D-Day in any talk about the weather, wouldn't you? So the most famous, uh, generally regarded as the most famous Met Office forecast results around D and, uh, the operate, Operation Overlord and forecast running up to D-Day. Um, up here we have the chart for 1am on the 5th of June. It might seem an odd time to pick, but actually that was the chart that was used to provide forecast information for the 3am conference, which was when Eisenhower and the Joint Chiefs just declared the invasion on. The second chart shows the position at 1pm on the 6th of June. It's more generally known as the D-Day chart, and it shows the position uh, of the weather during the period of some of the fiercest fighting. Conditions in early June were particularly unsettled and the forecasting teams had already advised against invading on the 5th, which would have meant forces leaving British shores on the 4th, because of poor weather. Stagg's diary, which we have here, reveals just how uncertain he was about advising of better weather on the 6th. It's far from easy to read, but this page includes the lines, I am now rather stunned, it's all a nightmare. Where are you hiding? There it is there. So going back to the charts for a moment themselves, uh, what Stagg, who was the, the main advisor to Eisenhower, was hoping was that this area of high pressure here would build in down towards the, the channel. You can see here, as a, a weather front lying over the channel, that would have been right in the way had they decided to invade on the 5th, so it shows it was definitely a good idea not to go then. Um, as you can see from the chart on the 6th, that area of high pressure hadn't actually built quite as far as they were hoping, which is why they always talk about it being so rough in the channel. Um, but actually, it did have its advantages. Um, it gave the Allies the advantage of surprise because German forecasters had thought that the evasion was not possible. Um, and the difference between the two was a key Allied advantage. As you'll see up here um, on the D Day chart, even though because it's a daytime chart, it's just easier to see. There's lots and lots of observations from across occupied Europe. And the reason for that is because the Allies had broken the Enigma code. So they were able to read all the German observations. Um, and get a much bigger, better picture of everything that was going on. Um, actually, the repetitious, repetitious nature of weather um, reports actually helped them to break the code in the first place. Um, and then if we have a quick look at the German code for much the same time, you'll see that there's no observations over the UK, because they haven't cracked any UK codes, and also no Atlantic, where most of the weather comes from. They didn't have air superiority, and they didn't have a great deal of information coming in from submarines, etc. So they just couldn't see that break in the weather, and that really made a big difference. Um, and to this day, obviously, weather forecasting remains a key element of military strategic operations. Wherever British forces are serving around the world, there's always supported by Met Office staff who serve what, what we call the Mobile Met Unit, and they're all RAF reserve officers. Now, no talk on the history of meteorology would complete, be complete without mention of computers. So my final element is the work of Lewis Fry Richardson, arguably the father of modern forecasting. In 1922, Richardson published his great work, The Weather Prediction by Numerical Process. Now that title doesn't sound all that groundbreaking, but actually in this volume, Richardson set out all the mathematical formulae that would be required to produce a weather forecast using a computer. Quite an incredible feat, 30 years before the first even remotely viable machine was actually built. It was also incredible for the circumstances in which it was written. Richardson worked as an ambulance driver during World War I and developed his theory during rest periods in the trenches. Indeed, the draft of his seminal work was actually <coughs> nearly lost to history when it was sent behind the lines for safekeeping during the Battle of Champagne and vanished. It turned up months later under a heap of coal. In his book, Richardson not only laid out the basis, basis for numerical weather prediction, as we now call it, the method by which all, more, all modern forecasting is essentially achieved, but also described the process by which he imagined his calculations could be carried out in a pre-computer age. In his text, computers actually means people carrying out computations, but the description he gives of a central individual controlling hundreds of separate modules and keeping them running in sync is actually remarkably close to the reality of how a supercomputer operates. 
I've shown this text to Met Office staff who specialise in our supercomputer, and several have said that it's as though Richardson's actually describing how to build a computer. The first Met Office supercomputer, a Ferranti Mercury nicknamed Meteor, was bought in 1959, and it was capable of 30,000 calculations a second, a significant achievement in its day, and it finally enabled numerical weather forecasting to move from theory to reality. Technology moved on apace, with each new computer doing more calculations and enabling even more complicated forecasting. By 1982, the CDC cyber was capable of 20 million calculations. By 1997, the Cray was doing more than 1 trillion. The latest Cray supercomputer, which you can see down on the left, on the right even, is capable of 23 trillion calculations per second. That's alternatively known as 23 quadrillion calculations, 23 petaflops, or more grains of sand than there are on every beach in the world every second. The data stored is going to be counted in exabytes. And in the digital, oh, in the digital area, no longer are we solely tasked with looking after paper records. We now care for digitised and born digital records too. It's a developing field and it brings many complications, as my colleagues in front will doubtless know. It is in the, in the, in the moving digital world. How do we keep up with some? How do we keep something readable or whatever passes for a computer in a hundred years' time when it was produced on a piece of software that became obsolete two years after it was written? It's a huge challenge, but it brings great benefits. No longer do you have to come to Exeter to view a lot of the items I've mentioned here today. With the digital era comes the digital archive, and thanks to the wonders of modern technology, not only can we properly care for electronic materials, we can also share our treasures with the world. Just here is a screenshot of our digital archive, which you can view and, and download things from for free. Uh, it's always growing, but it's certainly worth a look. Um, I would go to the link, but unfortunately I can't because I'm not on a secure connection. Um, but if you Google it, you'll definitely find it. <laughs>